Good morning, wise women. It's a special pleasure to see you all today. I only have two announcements and they're both good. To remind you all that Tuesday tomorrow, Parks and Rec has said wise women come in at 10 o'clock in the morning for walking and five o'clock in the evening together at the Cannons. And then on Thursday, if y'all are interested, you should be calling Ann Lloyd and or Arlene Bloom to join our May 20th, that's Thursday at one o'clock trivia. Don't forget. Now I'll turn it over to Margaret. Have a great day. Enjoy this. Hey, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our next Wise Women virtual meeting. We're, we're delighted that today we have Liam Lonigan from Westport Country Playhouse with us. I'm sure everybody knows Westport Country Playhouse and the wonderful things they do. Uh, Liam is the assistant director there and can give us a perspective of what's been going on and what's going to happen in the future. Uh, Liam also has a background working in other locations where he's been director and assistant director for various performances. So we're looking forward very much to what he has to say. And as with our other programs, you know, if there are any questions, we'll ask them at the end. Uh, when we get to the end, we'll also be joined by Liam's colleague, Jennifer Carroll, who's the community and sales manager for Westport Country Playhouse. So again, welcome everyone and, and special thanks to Liam and Jennifer for joining us. We'll turn it over to you now, Liam. Thank you, thank you. Um, Margaret and, and Barbara and, um, and Sean, thank you for all the, the back-end te uh, technological work and, and Jennifer, of course, um, my colleague at the Playhouse. Um, I had seen two productions um, directed by Mark Lamos at the Playhouse before ever considering to work there. Um, my roommate who grew up in Stanford dragged me to see, I don't know if any of you saw it, read uh, by John Logan, which was about uh, the painter Mark Rothko. And then also Mark's production of Romeo and Juliet in which two of my very close friends and, um, and friends from, from Syracuse University were in the cast. And I remember thinking the storytelling was super clean and driven. I had taken a train up from, I was living in Harlem at the time. Um, and I joined the staff for a season long contract as the directing fellow in 2018, which meant I was sort of the assistant director on every production that came in, assisting all the guest directors that had come to the Playhouse. Um, I was living in Harlem at the time after starting my own company in New York City but was eager to work away from the city actually, where I could experience the artistic freedom of the suburbs. And because I had seen Mark's directing before, I was really looking forward to assisting and, and working with him. And our first production together was A Flea in Her Ear um, by David Ives. And it was adapted uh, from the play by Georges Fado. It's a wild, farcical French piece with lots of love affairs, cheating and mischief and door slamming, all the things you, you know a farce to be. Um, the original production uh, of, of the Westport production had been directed in Newark, Delaware, actually, um, with a rep company. Um, it was a co-production with the resident ensemble players at the University of Delaware before it came to the Playhouse. Um, if you know what a co-production is, it's pretty much when multiple theaters um, pay for the same production and it just moves from one theater to the other. So by the time Aflin here had moved to Westport, it only needed a week or so of tech, um, or so we thought. And one huge aspect of this very ambitious set um, was a double-sided rotating bed. Far, uh, it was part of the Frisky Puss Hotel where half of the play takes place. Um, the, the bed was a huge mechanical piece. Um, the bed frame and the backboard flipping around to reveal another bed from an adjoining hotel room. And it was a busy first preview. I don't know if you've ever gone to previews of the Playhouse, but there are the four or five shows before we actually opened the play. Um, so things are, we're still working things out. We're rehearsing during the day. And it was a busy first preview. And during the climactic moment when the bed is meant to flip around and unveil a love affair in the next room, it had whipped around about a third of the way, jolted to a, like a swaying halt 
and then tried to move again. It was not budging. <laughs> and the actors stayed very cool. And Mark, who I'd never worked with before, this is our first show, grabbed my leg in anxiety, whispering, what the? You know, what was going on? The stage manager got on the loudspeaker um, saying that we needed to wait. And we did for about 20 minutes before beginning again. Um, but during those 20 minutes, while Mark was pacing back and forth in the last aisle, um, trying ev with every inch of his bones to stay calm, uh, David Kennedy, our associate artistic director, who had just been seeing the show because he was at the Playhouse and, and wanted to take some notes from Mark. And, and he had said to Mark, you do realize they're completely with you now. Mark said, what? And David said, the audience, now that we've stopped, you have them in the palm of your hands. And I knew exactly what he meant. And he was right. The moment we started back up, the audience was glued to the stage, enveloped by the piece, totally vocal, hysterically laughing, absolutely supportive. It was partly because of the technical glitch, but also because of what the Playhouse means to its audience, its town. It's that energy, I think, that defines my experience working here and why after the end of my fellowship, I begged Mark if I could stay on. You've probably heard uh, most of the history about the Playhouse. There's a lot to tell. Um, we're 90 years old um, and, <laughs> and uh, there's lots of stars who have made their way through the barn doors. You probably heard that Lawrence Langer took over the abandoned barn, formerly used as a tanning factory for leather hats in 1930 to start a repertory company. But in its bones, what's unique about the Playhouse, unlike every other theater founded in its era, was that it was started by actually New York producers, not citizens of the community. Other theaters in that day, the Stratford Festival, the Guthrie Arena Stage in DC, all these institutions began when a group of residents in the town got together and saw the need for a theater there literally growing out of the earth of the actual soil it sits on, but not the playhouse. And because of this New York City influence, with his authority and power, Langer was able to bring in huge stars of the day. Henry Fonda, Jessica Tandy, Groucho Marx, Thornton Wilder, Gene Kelly, Liza Minnelli, the list goes on and on. And if you've been in our lobby, you know, two stories high, floor to ceiling, there are posters with all these names on them. And I'm sure you probably know about the days of Jim McKenzie, after Langer, who devoted his life to keeping the Playhouse alive for 40 years or so. During his tenure, the Playhouse joined the Straw Hat Circle, the Straw Hat Circuit, excuse me, not the circle, a rotation of summer stock theaters to produce about 12 shows a summer during which audiences uh, saw TV and film celebrities of the day. And they had joined the Straw Hat Circuit with the Algonquit Playhouse and the Cape Playhouse, if I'm not mistaken. But toward the end of Mackenzie's 41 year stint at the Playhouse, the building and the campus were pretty much in total disrepair. And that leads to the story that you probably know of community members approaching locals Joanne Woodward, along with her husband, Paul Newman, to help launch a campaign to save the theater. And after a 30 plus million dollar campaign and a complete renovation, the Playhouse entered the 21st century as a totally new institution, an American theater of the past and present. And while the community saw the occasional star here and there, the Playhouse was maturing. In 2008, Paul was set to direct um, Steinbeck's of Mice and Men at the theater, a somewhat final artistic project for him to take on. And as the condition of his health became worse and worse, it became clear that he was most likely not going to end up helming the production. Since most theater artists in Connecticut kind of knew each other at the time, Annie Keefe, 
um, who is the associate artistic director, called Mark Lamos to gauge his interest. And it became clear that Paul couldn't go on. Mark took over and after Annie had coerced him into seeing the venue for the first time, that those beautiful velvet seats that had been recently renovated, Mark fell in love and he knew he needed to work there. You probably know if you've been to the Playhouse in the last 10 years or so, that as the artistic leadership transitioned from Mackenzie to Joanne Woodward to then Mark, it's become less of a summer stock star studded barn, but taking shape as a nonprofit regional theater, building a varied and strong body of work, which challenges norms, swaying from the easily digestible white comedies, increasing production value, and really broadening the spectrum of what this community could enjoy and learn from. The theater is an art form that allows us to enjoy and endure. I love that saying, enjoy and endure. Many of you here might see the theater as a place for you to laugh, unplug, and escape the world for two hours. And that is completely respectable and you're not alone in that sentiment. But that also leaves out a huge purpose and reason for why the theater has survived over 2000 years. In this art form, where stories are told in the same room as the audience, breathing the same air, taking the same space, feeling the same temperature, we get to experience the life the adventures, and very possibly the pain of another human being in front of us in real time. Theater draws a deep and personal empathy like no other art form can. You can be hundreds of feet away and still be shook in your seat, thinking things you've never thought before. Your life changed at what you've witnessed. And at the same time, you're experiencing it with 500 other people around you. It's pretty bizarre and powerful, I think. Um, in February of last year, I was in London, actually, seeing a bunch of shows and visiting teachers and friends since I had studied abroad there in college. And as the news of the virus decimating China had spread to Italy and then the American West Coast, the anxiety of the, in the city emerged in London. You could feel it down the street. And during the last play I saw, which was <laughs> wildly a beautiful seven and a half hour play at the National Theater, um, I could feel people becoming cautious, concerned. And during each intermission, of which there were five, we began opening the bathrooms with our elbows, I remember, and washing our hands without even needing to use the toilet. And I started seeing people with masks, which the sight of which really frightened me. I came back home preparing to begin rehearsals for Next to Normal at the Playhouse, an incredibly revolutionary rock musical, the winner of the 2010 Pulitzer Prize. And it was fully cast with an extraordinary team. Um, one day before we were uh, to meet in New York City for the first day, we postponed. Days later, we were sent home from the offices of the Playhouse. And a, and a few weeks later, the whole season was canceled and most of the staff lost their jobs, including me and Jennifer. We lost an entire season of thrilling work, most of which we're planning to bring back when we resume live full-scale productions again but which was uh, a new version of the Tony Award winning Fats Waller re uh, review, Ain't Misbehavin, to be adapted, choreographed and directed by the brilliant Camille Brown, in case you saw her work in Once on This Island on Broadway. And she's worked at the Met and, and many other places. And also a production of Pearl Clegg's Blues from Alabama Sky and an, a new adaptation, a commissioned new adaptation of Antigone. The only other time though, when the Playhouse didn't perform was during the war effort during World War II when the theater was paused for three years. But that means over 70 years, the Playhouse has produced nonstop. I would say a beacon of strength for the community throughout the ages, a real source of 
togetherness when we've needed it most. I think the hardest aspect of this year was not just losing our jobs, um, which was hard, of course, but that togetherness, that in-person, same space connection that makes theater so necessary. During our most frightened or vulnerable moments, elections, economic disaster, terrorist attacks, um, trial verdicts, death, it's been this community's artistic home. So what does it mean to be a theater organization and not make any theater? That's been the key this year um, as we've tried to figure out what that means. And we continue to grapple with it. How can we avoid in-person gathering when that's actually the only thing we do? The core of who we are, our mission, and how we connect to the community. Well, I think we've answered that question actually through a large series of projects and programs, which I'll start talking about in a moment, and um, and you should try to digest. Um, that now has us on overdrive. Um, and that enrich our audience and community during the time of theatrical darkness. So the first thing um, we had um, started uh, began with a, uh, our managing director fellow, Jacob Santos, who we had brought onto the staff before quarantine. And Jacob now attends the Yale School of Drama. He's a brilliant young mind. Um, and pretty much th the first thing we did um, during lockdown to interact with the community was a weekly Instagram live half hour conversation between Jacob and an artist that we had worked with at some point um, called Coffee Break. We focused uh, particularly on artists of color. Jacob inquired about how their lives and work had shifted since the pandemic began. It was a way to see the faces of people we knew. It's sort of a version of the the Zoom happy hours and get togethers you all, I'm sure, and we all had with our family and friends during the early days of the lockdown. Um, and it was a real joy. Um, and Jacob did a really good job. Um, and since the Playhouse had required huge funds to pay its skeleton staff that was left after the furloughs and to pay off its debt from the canceled year, a gala was necessary. Um, which would help secure donations for the Playhouse to continue, pretty much. Um, and so in October of 2020, we hosted a screening of a full-length documentary at the Remarkable Theater, uh, Drive-In Theater in Westport, that Mark had put together with um, an award-winning documentary director, Doug Tarola. And the film really centered the Playhouse, its 90-year history, and how it's faced the, the pandemic. Um, Something that has been talked about for years at the Playhouse, and I'm sure you at the Wise Women feel as well, is how do we get more young people involved? <laughs> I hear it all the time, all over Westport. How do we engage the younger generation so that our work can continue and stay relevant and make a difference in the lives of our children? So in 2020, the, the Playhouse really sort of broached this question with Gusto and launched a youth council as an advocacy group which supported the artistic and community building initiatives of the Playhouse as it's, as it's approaching its 90 year birthday. And it's run by Jenny Nelson, our Roz and Bud Siegel Director of Education and Community Engagement. Um, the youth council meets monthly and it's really about building a coalition of young ambassadors for the theater's mission and body of work. It's a chance for uh, young community members to speak their mind um, and build a sounding board for their opinions and discussions to help shape the future of the 90 year old cultural center. And I have to be honest with you, when I'm in these meetings, I am totally thrilled and inspired by these young um, and I, I say young, I'm 25 years old, um, but even younger um, minds talking about the, the Playhouse and what it means um, to Westport. And so students from Staples and Ridgefield and Wilton, Fairfield Ludlow, Greenwich, Bethel, Weston, and West Hill are currently represented in, on the council. And a central aspect of this council is part of our burning desire for equity really, and in, in that, for giving everyone a seat at the table. 
because when more voices can be heard, we empower our community to take part in actually what we're doing and how we can do it better. Um, and the next thing is um, cocktails with Mark. <laughs> Who wouldn't want um, a cocktail with Mark Lamos, our artistic director? If you've ever had one, you're always looking for an opportunity for another. Um, he makes a very mean <laughs> gin martini, um, but the man is a brilliant storyteller, a host, and an artistic mind. When you're speaking with him, you're the only person in the room and nothing else matters. His questions are poignant, really genuine and intelligent. Um, so one of the Playhouse's new programs that in a way took over for Jacob's Coffee Break, which I mentioned, is Cocktails with Mark. And it's a virtual happy hour um, with him and with a new guest every episode. So those are happening throughout the, the season. And recently, Mark spoke with Milia Bensusen, um, the newly appointed artistic director of Hartford Stage in Hartford, Connecticut, which um, they had a really good conversation about because Mark ran the Hartford Stage Company for, for about 17 years. Um, and they'll continue these um, throughout the season. And they're available on YouTube as well as Facebook Live. Um, and next, through the magic of radio, the Playhouse brought to life the, uh, the classic Dickens tale of the greatest miser of all time. And you know him, Ebenezer Scrooge. And so like Christmas Carol, the ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future haunt this old man, teaching him a lesson about appreciating those around him, especially during the most joyous time of the year. And that happened during, during the holidays this year. Um, and it was broadcast through a partnership of WSHU Public Radio, and it spread the tale to homes across Fairfield County in two parts, along with several interviews with the team, all of which you can actually still listen to. I go back to them every once in a while. Um, and even though we're entering the summer, why not listen to an interview uh, with the cast of A Christmas Carol um, on our website and on our YouTube. The piece was adapted and directed beautifully by Mark Shanahan and sound was designed and composed by the incredible artist, John Gramada who works all over New York. Um, so the next thing is um, new works, new voices. And it's, this is an amazing, amazing program. Um, it was written in response to Lila Saad's Me and White Supremacy. And it was a celebration of, new, of the work of Dr. Martin Luther King, for Martin Luther King Day. Um, and it was an event in January of this year where four local artists, Gracie Brown, um, Tanisi Davis, Tamika Petway, and Terrence Riggins performed original monologues on the Playhouse stage. And it was recorded and released on our website and YouTube channels. This program is just another way that the Playhouse shows its commitment to fostering new voices for our community to hear and engage with. Um, and you'll like this one. So, the American theater would not exist the same, and you know this if you've, if you've heard the name of the play, without Thornton Wilder's play, Our Town. It's one of the most widely produced pieces in American history and broke barriers in terms of form and storytelling and style. Um, it takes place in a small fictional town of Grover's Corners, it's called, in 1901 through 1913. And it, it really tracks you through the unraveling lives of everyday experiences of its citizens in that town. What's so brilliant about it is its innate metatheatricality. And what I mean by that is um, it, it knows it's a play and it leans into that. So the setting of the piece is actually in a theater on, and, and you're performing it on a stage. So the main character and the host of the, play, of the evening is the stage manager, sort of the main character. And so to just to touch on Playhouse history again, Thornton Wilder, who wrote the play in 1938 and um, actually in 1947, Wilder performed the role of the stage manager in the play at the Westport Playhouse. And fast forward to 2002 when Joanne Woodward programmed the play directed by James Naughton with Paul Newman playing the stage manager. 
the play, of course, that production, of course, transferred to Broadway at the Booth Theater. Um, but I just, it gives you a perspective of the kind of history we're dealing with at the Playhouse. And Howard Sherman, former director of the American Theater Wing, has penned a book spanning the history of Our Town called Another Day's Begun, Our Town in the 21st Century. And it tracks through pr various productions across America um, of, of Our Town since the 21st century began at prisons and in inst mental institutions and schools and the Playhouse. And um, it's fascinating and really gives you a perspective of, of what this play means to this, to this country and to its culture. So the Playhouse hosted a panel conversation facilitated by Mark between Howard Sherman, who wrote the book, Jake Robards, who is, um, uh, is the child of Jason Robards, um, the famous actor, but also the he was a child actor in 2002 in the Paul Newman production. And Annie Keefe was also part of the conversation, who was the associate artistic director at the time of that, um, of that Broadway production. And so, at the height of the pandemic, this is the next thing, since we weren't programming, gathering people in the Jason Robards Theater, um, our main stage, it felt natural to reflect on recent past productions that hold special places in our memories and hearts. One that came to mind immediately, and I was just talking to uh, Margaret about this, was our 2019 production of Lin-Manuel Miranda's In the Heights. Uh, which broke box office records at the Playhouse like we never imagined. It was helmed by director-choreographer Marco Santana, um, who was actually in the original, Bra uh, original Broadway company, but he actually, Marcos was even at the first, first reading of In the Heights, sitting across the table from Lin-Manuel, um, and, and our production at the Playhouse actually um, had Marcos, of course, who's in the original Broadway company, but also three other original Broadway company members. Um, in the Heights, among many things, is a celebration of culture, family, and finding home um, taking place in Washington Heights, New York City. And it's the show that Lin-Manuel wrote um, before Hamilton, which he's known for, of course, um, but also in the Heights. So we had a program co uh, concept to curtain that we had launched with Beyond El Barrio being the first. And it's uh, a series of mini documentaries following the creation and production process behind the making of, makings of certain shows at the Playhouse. So we're start, we started with In the Heights. And designers Fabian Aguilar, uh, Maria Cristina Fuste, Adam Koch, and music director Dan Green spoke to their joys and challenges making the magical piece in Westport. Um, and it was a really, really joy, a joyful um, documentary to watch and, you, and it's still available and you should check it out, especially if you saw the production um, in 2019. So part of our well-known script in hand series, which I'm sure many of you have been a part of and have subscribed to, um, script in hand has turned virtual this year and a Sherlock Carroll was a, was a mystery mashup featuring characters from the works of Arthur Conan Doyle and Charles Dickens. It was written and directed by Mark Shanahan and starred Broadway's Drew McVetty as Sherlock Holmes, Richard Henry as Scrooge, and several other wonderful talents who were kind enough to work, uh, to work with us on the project. And that was the first script in hand um, this year as we transitioned into the virtual space. Story Hour with Jenny is an educational program growing out of our newly formed official education department of which um, Jennifer Carroll, who's on this call, is also a part. Um, and Story Hour is a virtual interactive reading series of social justice picture books for kids grades uh, K through three. And it's read by Jenny Nelson, Rosin, uh, Bud Siegel, uh, Director of Education and Community Engagement. And in, so in March, we had launched the program, began with a really beautiful picture book, Toni Morrison's Please Louise, and then continued in April with a book called 
maybe something beautiful, how art transformed a neighborhood. And what happens is all the books in the series are written and illustrated by black indigenous or writers of color. And when a child signs up for the program, they are sent a copy of the book, which is purchased by the Playhouse, usually from a black owned bookstore. And it arrives in the mail along with an activity packet curated by the education department. And what's really unique about this program is that it's a reading of the book live, but it's also interactive. So it's not like you're watching a TV show. Um, your, your child is, is actually engaging with Jenny and, and answering questions and asking questions. And, and it's a really beautiful thing for you to experience with your child and, and part of the playhouse. Um, and the next thing is an event, a continuation of the New Works, New Voices MLK celebration that I mentioned before. And it's called New Works, New Voices, Phenomenal Women Inspire. And it was organized to celebrate International Women's Day in March. Led by Jennifer Carroll, who's on this call, Phenomenal Women Inspire featured stories about five outstanding women um, who are Constance Baker Motley, Mary Freeman, Mary McLeod Bethune, Gloria Steinem, and Ann Bogart. And they were written by five outstanding women, local women, Alana Jiffis, Bernstein McLeod Bailey, Sheena Graham, and Michelle Burns. And that beautiful event, I was just checking a little bit of it this morning again. I was watching a little bit of it and it's, it's really wonderful. And that exists also on our YouTube channels and website. And you're also gonna get, um, I think, a link to our YouTube channel because a lot of this stuff lives there now that we're so virtual. Telling um, Malima's tale is next. Um, and I'm not sure if any of you saw Malima's tale at the Playhouse in 2019, but it was an extraordinary production of Lynn Nottage's play about the journey of ivory after it's hacked off of an elephant in Kenya and shipped to Vietnam and then eventually sold in China. It's a wild piece. In many ways, it's about the abuse and slaughter of elephants, but also about the history life and energy that exists in objects surrounding us. Um, so when you see a piece of real ivory, the life that lives in it still, um, even though it's left its elephant, um, its owner. And so it was part of our Concept of Curtain series and Mark Lemos, who was the director of Malima's Tale, spoke with designers Fabian Aguilar, Claire DeLiso, who designed the set, Yana Birkova, who did projections, Michael Keck, who was a composer, choreographer Jeffrey Page, and actor Jermaine Rowe, who played um, Malima. We spoke in depth about the creation of this very unique piece and challenging in many ways on our stage um, when four actors had to actually play over 20 characters. We're just changing costumes left and right. Um, and the designers had to travel countless cities and continents following the path of these ancient tusks. It's a, it's a very unique piece um, and one of my favorites I've ever worked on at the Playhouse. And so the concept of Curtain um, was that discussion with those designers and that documentary lives on our YouTube um, channel and, and on our website too. Moving forward, um, Evan Zess shared his wild real life experiences as a struggling actor who finds a way to secure one of the last remaining rent control departments in New York City. Um, Zess portrays 25 characters in this wacky solo show, Love Letter to Theater, as he searches for an acceptance um, and a place to call home. Um, so this show was just recent and it ran online from April 26th and it just closed May 2nd. And it was directed by Mark Shanahan as part of our Script in Hand play reading series. Um, and there will be mo many more of these throughout the season. And if you're a Script in Hand subscriber or, or goer, um, you, you, you'll have many more opportunities um, for others that are in the works currently. I came to work at the Playhouse through the internship and fellowship program. And um, I'm fortunate enough that they haven't kicked me out yet, um, <laughs> but uh, with all the mischief I caused. But um, every year we offer paid internships to local students wishing to gain further experience and exposure 
at, at a professional theater environment, pretty much. Um, this year, though, we still remain virtual as we did last year. We're continuing to offer internships again in the areas of development, education, and marketing. Two other educational programs include Getting to Know You, um, which was very early on the pandemic, I'm remembering, which was a musical theater masterclass with Kelly O'Hara, who's a Playhouse friend. Um, and and it, it was a masterclass for local Fairfield County students um, and, and having Kelly sort of guide them through these pieces. It was really wonderful to watch. Um, and also one other um, educational program that we have done is was the Thrive Virtual Summer Camp, and that was a partnership with the Schubert Theater in Long Wharf in New Haven. So these programs, like the Youth Council I mentioned before, really encapsulate our desire to bring young energy, not just to our audience, but to respect it enough to bring it to the daily operations of the Playhouse. Um, and since I started my journey here a few years ago, um, I've been obsessed with the New Works Initiative, and it's possible you haven't heard of it, and that's okay. To me, the New Works Initiative holds the artistic future of the Playhouse in its bones. Developing new plays is an art form in itself, really and a vital act in wanting to support writers, the creation of new stories too, and to really contribute to a healthy theater ecology. Several years ago, a group of 10 donors got together to launch a program and they created the inaugural New Works Circle that would support readings and fund these workshops for emerging writers and their workshops and readings, and they happen over a couple days or so. They typically exist in the barn, in the rehearsal studio. Um, and you, sometimes there's a small invited reading um, for, for, for guests and for the new work circle and staff um, so that the, the writer can hear their, their play out loud after making some edits over the last couple days. There is no better feeling for me um, than giving an artist the most valuable experience uh, and resource to them. Um, and the, that resource is time and space for a writer, the most valuable, I think. So we hire a director, a stage manager, and a, and a cast of actors to work through the play um, for a series of days in the barn. Um, it allows the writer to hear the play out loud, maybe for the first time. And, and because of the safe space, they're able to take bold risks and make big edits. And so they'll leave after a day and they'll come in and the stage manager will be frantically printing out the new script and giving it to the actors. It's a wonderful buzzing experience. Um, plays come to us in all different forms, ready for, for production, not ready for production, not fully written. Um, and, that, and it's our job to create that supportive space, that laboratory really, um, for these writers to experiment in. And this year we have programmed two workshops so far that will take place at, uh, online. Um, Immaculate Perfection by Daniel Halpern, who is a student of, um, at, at the uh, MFA, he's an MF, MFA candidate in um, the University of Alberta. Um, and Culture Shock by Gloria Mahule, um, who's a writer from Tanzania, who's in her third year at Yale. Um, also, the Playhouse was lucky to receive a grant from the Lawrence Hatcher Foundation to launch our first series of commissioned writers, playwrights who will be paid to compose new plays from scratch for the Playhouse to develop and produce. Um, this is really thrilling for me. Um, our first two commissions will be Matthew Green, who wrote, I'm not sure if you saw, but who wrote Thousand Pines, um, in 2018 for, for us, um, and Monet Hurst Mendoza, whose play we had developed as part of the New Works Initiative um, called Torreira. And give her, given the labor intensive nature of writing plays at all, um, the commissions are a multi-year process um, and an investment in these writers' plays, but also their future. And it happens over a course of a few years. Um, so we have um, those writers working on their first drafts right now. Additionally, the Radio Suspense Theater 
we'll be commissioning three writers of color to write uh, radio dramas for the Playhouse to record and broadcast in partnership with WSHU, similar to the project um, uh, A Merry Little Christmas Carol that we had done with them. So the first will be, and it's being edited right now, is a Thai ghost story by um, Kevin Panmi Chow called The Return, which will be released at the end of this month on public radio. When we halted our season in 2020, we canceled a production of Michael Gotch's Tiny House, a hilarious and thoughtful piece about a family and the current state of our world, all taking place in the woods at a tiny house barbecue on uh, the 4th of July. Thankfully, we are still producing it. Um, I actually have to run to one of our final days of recording today after this in a little bit after I leave you. Um, so if you've watched a play on Zoom though, like the images um, that, that we've been showing you about the little, the, the, the different boxes with an actor in each of them, uh, that's what a Zoom play looks like. You can toss that away. All the actors for Tiny House are safe in their separate homes. We, we have literally shipped an entire film studio to them, pretty much. Um, so costumes and wigs and props and a green screen that's 20 feet large and microphones and we a webcam and iPhones and lights. All of this um, has been sent to all of them. And what happens is, it's kind of wild, um, we're in a Zoom room um, and and Mark is there, who's the director, and I'm there, and stage manager, and a director of photography, and some designers. Um, and the actors have their phones, um, and their iPhones that we have ordered for them kind of like up like this, so we can see what, they are what the iPhone is recording. And they record locally in the iPhones, and they um, upload them, and then an editor puts everyone's footage together. And since they're behind a, in front of a green screen, it all turns into a film pretty much. And all the actors are in the same space. Um, it's it's gonna take um, a while for it to be edited. We're, we're stopping in a couple days, but um, it will be released um, in July. And um, it's a thrilling ride for sure. And we're really excited for our audiences to see it. It's amazing technology. Um, so, um, only a couple more things. Thank you for being so patient. Um, after A Flea in Your Ear, the, the show I, I, I mentioned at the beginning, um, the second production I worked on with Mark was Man of La Mancha, which is the 1965 Dale Wasserman and Mitch Lee musical based on Cervantes' novel Don Quixote, which maybe some of you read in high school or something. Um, with an all Latinx company, this 2018 production was one of the most exquisite pieces of theater I've been a part of. There was actually talk of possibly moving the production to Broadway at the Roundabout Theater, but we don't think that's happening now, of course, because of the pandemic um, and so many projects have shifted. But we will be streaming our 2019 production of it August 23rd through September 5th online. So you have to, if you didn't see it at the Playhouse or even if you did and liked it, you must see it again. Um, I can't wait to see it again. It's beautiful music, gripping imagery and an addictive message about dreaming the impossible. And so finally, last thing, uh, we'll be producing Doubt by John Patrick Shanley. Um, it's an incredible parable about a New York City Catholic school in the 60s when a new black student um, starts to attend the school. And the mother superior suspects misbehaving on behalf of the, the pastor, Father Flynn. And it's a whirlwind of suspicion, accusations, and doubt. Um, and it will be directed by David Kennedy, our associate artistic director. It's really one of the plays that made me fall in love with the theater, I have to say. Um, and it really creates amazing discussions afterwards. So um, for now, it's, it's our sincere hope that we can return to in-person events this season. You know, as you hear about Broad, we were just talking about this with Barbara and, and um, Margaret before starting this, you know, Broadway's opening up and, and they're starting to sell tickets again. Of course, we want to do the same. Um, we have very strict measures in place, um, led by um, and developed by our leadership, Michael Barker, our managing director, and Mark, um, and the board. 
um, in conjunction with the CDC guidelines. Um, and we have like a co mini coalition on our board really handling this and paying attention to every, every number. Um, and our guidelines say that if the case count is in a specific place and declining, we will produce in person indoors at varied capacities that will go up and up. But this detailed plan and guide will be our roadmap toward a playhouse that sees your faces again. Um, and we're relying on it, um, you know, throughout the rest of the year. I would be lying to you um, if I didn't update you on the Playhouse's uh, year. Um, if I didn't mention our anti-racism efforts, um, really important. And it's written response, obviously, to the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, and the 30-page list of demands from Black, Indigenous, and theater artists of color given to white institutions, and it's titled, We See You White American Theater, demanding equity and transparent practices. And being, if you've been to the Playhouse, being an extremely white institution, the Playhouse is taking very serious steps to right our wrongs, um, expand transparency, and to strengthen equity in our work. This is part of almost everything we do now. And as the world opens its eyes and the theater industry evolves in response, um, we'll be there and evolving with it. The Playhouse <laughs> for 90 years has been an organization devoted to its community, its artists, and its storytelling. Though we are producing theater, it is completely meaningless without you, our subscribers and our supporters who stick with us even when the mechanical rotating beds cause us to stop the show. Theater, to me, reaches its most magical moment at the marriage between story and an audience. And it's in that moment that we share common ground and revel in the opportunity to maybe, just maybe, guide someone to feel or think something that they never have before. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liam. Can, can you hear me now? Is, Absolutely. Can there? Okay, great. So and um, that was a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. I, I'm wow. sure everyone enjoyed it. Um, Thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We have a number of comments and we have questions. Some of them are about the past year and what has gone on with everything you've had to do there. And some are general questions. So I'll just briefly summarize some of the comments and then go on to ask the questions related to the past year and then go on to some general questions. Sure. So starting with the positive comments are <clears throat> extremely positive. Just People loved your presentation. They love Westport Playhouse. And they are obviously enough looking forward to the events that you've described. So um, we all look forward to that. And certainly <clears throat> people would prefer when we can do it in person, but even before then, the other events and the way you've adjusted to them has been you know, very impressive and, and something that's a, a tremendous contribution to our community. So thank you all very much. I know uh, that there was a lot of work involved with that, but just so you know, we do appreciate it. Um, some questions related to COVID. Um, what was the biggest challenge? We, we know we've all had all kinds of challenges the past year. It's something nobody ever anticipated. What was the biggest challenge that Westport Playhouse uh, faced during that year and, and how did you address it? It's, it's amazing. And, and Jennifer, you can feel free to pop in with any of these. I. Uh, it's a similar challenge to what every theater has faced, is that the, the mission of the organization, that the actual activity of why the organization was made in the first place was for in-person events. That's the reason it exists at all. <laughs> and and the, it's, you know, it's, it's like restaurants and it's like movie theaters, um, but for that to be taken away, the whole rug is ripped out from an, from, from below you. And so you, I think the Playhouse, I know I did as a theater artist, um, but the Playhouse had to go, so who are we now without it? Like, li like literally what, not what do we do, but, but purpose wise, like if we can't do that, what do we do? 
And though, yes, many organizations just put things online or started streaming things or just put things, you really have to question your, the, the meaning of who you are to a community. And so what happened is it took a while. It took a while for programs to come out and they, you know, Mark and a lot of the, the leaders in the organization had a brainstorming meeting every Friday afternoon. And they started thinking through some programs that they could do really pondering, I guess, who, yeah, who are we now? What would make sense? What actually, what could be a meaningful experience? And what they came up with was that we are a community organization. We are not just a theater. We don't just put on plays, but we are, you know, when you look at the, and I'm going to shut up in a second, but I love this question. Um, when you look at the makings of a town at all, you have a, da- like a town hall, maybe you have a library, maybe you have um, sidewalks, maybe a park, a church, you know, other places of worship, and you have a theater. That's, th- those are the cornerstones of making a town and building a community. So now it goes, okay, if we are a community organization, an artistic community organization, how can we engage in other ways, maybe online and safely, that isn't about being in person? So that was, I think, the biggest one. I don't know. Well, you've certainly done a great job, and we appreciate you doing that, and we appreciate the mission that you've identified for yourself. Um, our next question asks about that tiny house production, which is very impressive with all the technology involved there. Um, can you tell us about um, the performers' feelings in being part of that? I know we always hear a lot of stage performers say it's the audience that invigorates them and that interaction, having people there. Here, they're, they're not having that directly. I mean, they have a virtual audience, but they don't have people in front of them. Have any of the performers expressed hesitancy about participating in this kind of event or are they just happy they're able to perform? Great question. Really good question. So the company that uh, makes up the cast of Tiny House is similar to the, when I mentioned um, A Flea in Your Ear, it's the, they're a repertory company um, from, from Delaware, the University of Delaware. And so they've worked together for years and years and years, the same group of actors. And they've been doing radio plays um, at their company at the University of Delaware throughout the pandemic. So they're used to this technology, but not the video version, um, which we've added and, and given to them throughout through this production. I would say it hasn't been hesitancy, but I do, it's a challenge for sure, because the actors, specifically the ones I'm closer with and, and have a working relationship um, in the company, they're uns- they can't read how well it's going. Like, it's sort of like what you, pred- you know, predict it. So I'm there, <laughs> you know, one of the actresses, um, um, Elizabeth, she has her cell phone down at her feet. And I am, after we finish a take um, and the stage manager yells cut, I text her a quick note and go, oh my God, great, great. This is great. Oh wait, what about this? And she quickly looks at it or it's wild. Um, and we've really taken over, I feel so... I feel so bad for a lot of them. We've asked a lot of them throughout this, this process, but we've taken over their homes. I mean, we have to fit a huge studio taking up a whole room in their house. It's, it's a lot to ask, um, but they are, have been the most game and, and brilliant group of artists um, and just being patient and, and knowing that they're lucky to have a job right now and they like this play and they believe in, in the artists and the editors that are gonna make it happen. So they're working through it, but that's a great question. Yeah. Well, we're, we're certainly glad they, they have. Um, another question related to, to this past year is that, you know, you have the people who are participating virtually and seeing one of some of these wonderful events you've held. And of course you always had some people who came in person to Westbrook Kentucky Playhouse. Are those audiences different? Do you have any people who are joining the, the virtual that were not in the other, or is there any way of telling if they're totally different groups or just some overlap? Yeah, Jennifer, do you wanna? Um, yeah, so the one thing that's great about um, being virtual it, right now is that we are able to kind of expand our audience. So we use a service called Broadway On Demand for our regular season productions of Tiny House that we stream through them. So we're actually able to 
um, get a national audience uh, through our streaming productions, including Tiny House, and then having all of these other programs available on YouTube for free has also allowed us to expand um, the uh, audience as well. Um, our next question in concerns what kind of advice you might give to people in MFA programs now if, you know, they're looking forward to the future. And I guess, you know, two years ago, we probably would have given them some different advice than, than now. Um, how could you share your experience with some of the people who are thinking they might end up in a position like yours a few years from now when they finish their programs and their studies and so on? What, you know, what have you learned that you could pass on to? Well, that's a great question. Um, I, I would, I could talk about this for forever. And if anyone wants <laughs> to contact me, I, I have a huge soapbox about this, but I had a, a mentor um, named Bob Moss who started a, a company called Playwrights Horizons in New York City. And he was the first person that I asked this question to, what do I do after I graduate? What do I do? And I said, I, like, should I go to another school? Should I go to another program? Should I assist? Should I start a company? Um, I mean, producing in New York City is so expensive. Blah, blah. And he said, you know what you just did there? You put an obstacle in front of yourself for why not to do it. Don't do that. <laughs> and that's it. You just, a lot, making theater is simpler than we think. Of course, we need a job to survive, right? To pay our rent and, and to support ourselves. But and you can figure out a way to do that. Um, I, when I first graduated college, I've never said this in public, but I secretly worked at a Dunkin' Donuts 50 hours a week until I made enough money to move to the city. Um, I was miserable, but I did it. You just do it. You know, it's, it's, it's simple. Um, it's not easy always, but if you want to be in this profession, you'll always find a way to make it happen. And you'll walk, you'll walk past a park and you'll say, I think a show should happen there. Or you'll read a play and go, I think I should produce this. And if you decide that you'll do it, then you'll do it. There's nothing in your way. Um, yeah, I, I could, yeah. It's, a, it's an amazing, inspiring thing to be graduating right now. Um, well, we hope they have the same creativity and perseverance that you have. <laughs> Look forward to what they might do in the future. Um, we only got a few minutes left, so let's take some of these questions that are uh, more general, not really directly related to COVID. Um, asking about how the performances are chosen, you know, in general, and, you know, again, this, this year is an aberration to be sure. But in general, how does Westbrook Country Playhouse decide which uh, performances, uh, given who's involved in selecting them, or, and what do you do in terms of are they trying to have a balance or to pick out certain things, you know, a popular, how does that work out? It's, um, it's amazing. And, and, you know, now because of being online, there's so many programs. So everyone, pretty much every department, like, like Jennifer and, and marketing and uh, production and development are all creating new programs by themselves. And usually the, you know, kind of programming, um, like the productions is coming from the artistic department, but what's been great about being virtual is that it's coming from everywhere and it's artistic. Um, but the plays are chosen in a very fluid way. It's an amazing process. Um, we meet at least over a year in advance. So we're already starting to talk about um, 2022, of course, and beginning to ruminate about 2023, um, which is wild. Um, but it, you know, plays come into the mix and they leave, and then we talk about them and then they leave. But really, Mark, which actually he says in the documentary um, that we did at the Remarkable Theater, and it's a documentary all of you, if you get a chance, um, should watch if you if you get the opportunity to, um, if it ever be if it becomes public is that he, we imagine um, an audience member has a buffet in front of them. And it's our job to choose pretty much the widest variety of work so that you can come to something and fall in love and laugh your butt off and, and be overjoyed. And then the next to be, uh, you know, I wasn't really, uh, okay, you know, this one, but I learned a little bit or I learned what I don't like about th this kind of show or it's a, it must be varied 
and it must be um, diverse too. Um, and so the, the widest variety possible, and that's what really builds a, a community. You know, uh, Lissy Newman, who's Paul Newman's daughter, um, she's been a friend of the Playhouse for many years. She used to say like that her father said that, you know, you don't root for your baseball team just when they win. You attend games um, all season long. And so when you're a subscriber at the Playhouse, you don't just go to shows that you know you'll love. You go to everyone because you learn something from each of them. So the biggest variety possible. Um, and it's, there's not a structured process to choose plays. It kind of grows. Um, but well, you've, you've certainly been doing a good job. So we hope that continues. We have time for only really one more question. So let me just take one of these questions related to some of the changes you've made in the past year. You described a youth council. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that works and are there any suggestions that came from that youth council that you're implementing or any ways you see them changing what the Westport Country Playhouse would be doing? Jennifer, you want to touch on that? Yeah, um, so it's, uh, yeah, like Liam said, it's uh, 14 uh, young people from across Connecticut um, that we meet with monthly. Um, so we, we asked them, one of the questions that we asked them was what their favorite um, piece of theater that they've ever seen and like what inspired them. Um, and from that, we learned a lot. Uh, and we just uh, generally just let them know about what's going on at the theater and have them uh, give them access to watch all of those uh, programs for free so that they can come back to us and give us real time feedback on what they responded to in those things so that we can move forward to, to provide more programming for um, a youth audience um, who is so much smarter and intelligent than you would think that they are thinking things that uh, at that age, I would never have even been exposed to. It's, they're truly remarkable. And they're actually going to develop a project uh, to support a, a local um, organization in December together uh, at the Playhouse, hopefully in person. So that's well, kind that's of their culminating project. That sounds wonderful. We're so happy you're doing that. And unfortunately, what I'm not happy about is that we are out of time. So <laughs> uh, we'll have to say goodbye and, and thank you so much for this. It's been great. And we all look forward to participating in events with Westport Country Playhouse. I wish you well. And I don't know, I guess a year from now, I guess I could, well, I shouldn't say that. I was going to say we'll all be back in person, but I, I'll never say that again. <laughs> we, we hope we'll be back in person, right? That's right. Okay, thanks again. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.